Our special guest today is Mr. David Rubin from Shiloh, Israel. Uh, he's out there on the front lines, and I love people like David. Uh, of course, we go to Israel every year, have for the last 20 years, so I, I know the area very well. And uh, to me, that's the finest of the people of Israel are those who are out there attempting to do what God commanded them to do. So we have a very deep appreciation, David, for what you're doing. And one more thing, uh, we were speaking before our, our break about uh, why Moshe Dayan did not, um, why he would turn over the Temple Mount to the jurisdiction of the Muslim Waqf rather than do what God would want him to do. And I think probably the other reason, and you, I'm sure you would agree, is that being secular himself, and most of the government at that time was secular, they were afraid if they would tear down the Dome of the Rock and the Al-Aqsa Mosque and would build a temple, that it would bring such a, a revival that the secular would be swept aside and the religious would become prominent in the nation of Israel. And I think they were afraid they would lose their own power. That's been my judgment. Well, I should just point out that uh, I don't think that they, the, there was even a thought at that time to rebuild the Holy Temple exactly at that time. Uh, but but we, what we wanted was, was that uh, it should be a clear, declared Israeli sovereignty over the Temple Mount. Well, you know, there was one other thing that happened that I thought was really interesting. Slomo Gorin, who was the um, religious, the rabbi. The chief of the, rabbi. Yeah, of the defense forces mm -hmm. at the time. He actually pulled dynamite out of his uh, knapsack and handed it to General Uzi and said, General, we must remove these pagan holy places now. And this was all recorded in Haaretz, and it was an interview with Haaretz that they agreed they would keep it secret until both of those men died. And after the death of General Uzi, it was published, and I have the account. So it's very interesting that Goran said here, and General Uzi said, uh, Rabbi, go on. Uh, you can't do that. And he insisted, oh, you must do it. Now you go down in history. And General Uzi said, uh, Rabbi, if you say one more word, I will take you to jail. And Goran walked away sadly. So he understood what should have happened at that time. Yes, well, well Rabbi Goran was a great man. And uh, uh, when, when, when Israel recaptured the Temple Mount, uh, the, the soldiers put the, the Israeli flag on top of the Dome of the Rock, and, uh, which is the mosque, the big mosque mm -hmm. up there. And they, uh, so there was, there was a bit of an uproar in the Islamic world. But, but look, th this is a lesson to be gained. Uh, we have to know that every few years, God, God gives us opportunities. Uh, as Israel as a nation, as a people, he gives us opportunities to do what we're supposed to be doing. Uh, to look at the Bible for guidance, to say, okay, what do we need to do next? And that was an opportunity that was a missed opportunity. There will be more opportunities. Hopefully we'll act prudiciously and you know, we'll, we'll, we'll do what we need to do. Now, David, there's something very important I want to get to right now because uh, you had an unusual experience. Uh, you went out, and uh, how long was it before you became the mayor of Shiloh? Well, I lived in Israel for uh, several years. I became very active in, in the life of the country and in, in the life of the community of, of Shiloh. And after... after uh, well, it was about uh, almost 10 years I'd been living there, about eight years, I guess, I became mayor. And, uh, well, the, the position of mayor of, of Shiloh is a very honorable position, uh, but, but frankly, there, there are a lot of things that I've been doing since then that, that have a lot more significance. Uh, but, you, you know, as mayor, you spend, end up spending so much time uh, talking to people about filling potholes and things like that, that... Uh, I'm, I'm more involved in bigger things right now. Okay, and we're going to talk about that before we're done. But before we do, though, you had an interesting experience. Um, you were attacked. Your car was attacked by a terrorist. Uh, tell us the story. What happened? Well, it was 10 years ago. Uh, my three-year-old son and I were coming back from Jerusalem, and he was buckled into the baby seat, and I'm driving my car. We're driving up to Shiloh from Jerusalem on the, on the dark country road that is known as the Road of the Patriarchs, because that is the road up to Samaria where the patriarchs 
would travel, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, uh, during, during biblical times. That was the only north-south mountain ridge road at the time. Well, we're halfway up, and suddenly the car is hit by a massive hail of bullets from the right side. I didn't realize that it was from the right side at that point. The car went completely dead. The terrorist was shooting. I saw four orange sparks in front of my eyes, and I felt a bullet crash into my left leg. Blood started coming out almost like an open fire hydrant. I quickly tried to start the car. The car was dead. It was just coasting down the hill. The bullets were flying. And I remember that I had my three-year-old son sitting behind me. I turned around to him. My son's name is Reuven, or Ruby for short. I said, Ruby, are you okay? His eyes were wide open. His mouth was wide open. Uh, He looked like he was trying to scream or to cry, but no sounds were coming out. And I I didn't see any blood on him, so I assumed that he was okay, uh, that he was just in shock from the shooting. So I quickly tried to start the car thinking, I just got to get to an ambulance because the blood is coming out of my leg fast and furious. Well, I, I, I turned the ignition. The car wouldn't start. I turned it again. The car wouldn't start. I shifted gears, parked, drive, neutral, doing everything I could to get the car to start, and it wasn't starting. Finally, I, I just closed my eyes. I turned the ignition one more time, and the car started. It started as if it had never had a problem starting before. I drove, hit the gas, drove the car nearly 120 miles an hour to get to the next community up the road where I hoped I could find an ambulance. I pull up to the gate of the community. Now you have to understand, all of the communities in Samaria and also in Judea have metal gates in the front of the community, not because they're elite communities by no means, uh, but because we have to keep out car bombers. So I, I, I pull up to the gate as closely as I could get. I started screaming to the guard at the gate, ambulance, please, get an ambulance. He didn't seem to hear me. There was a young woman on the side of the road. She started jumping up and down, screaming, ambulance, ambulance, don't you hear? At that point, everyone who was within sound's reach came running up to the car. Some teenagers from the bus stop came to see what was going on. The gas station attendant from the gas station across the street ran right up to my car door, ripped open the door, ripped off my shirt, wrapped it around my leg. He said, I also, I'm also a paramedic. I know what I'm doing. Don't worry. And he, he tried to stop the blood flow. He handed me his cell phone. He said, quick, call your wife. So I dialed my, while well, I tried to dial my wife, my hand was shaking too much. I couldn't dial. He dialed it for me. And I told my wife I've been shot in the leg. Hopefully an ambulance soon will be coming and take me to the hospital. And Ruby is okay. Well, she said, okay, I'll, t- I'll try to get to Jerusalem somehow. And at, at that point, you have to understand, there was shooting on the roads all the time. So it was e- even just to go to Jerusalem was a question about whether you were going to make it. And uh, so, so we got to the hospital. Well, no, oh, no, we didn't get to the hospital yet. The ambulance came first. And the, the ambulance uh, medics come running out. One of them comes running into the car and he unbuckles my son from the baby seat. I said, no, no, please leave him alone. He's just been uh, in shock. He's, he needs to be with his Abba. He needs to be with his dad. And the, the, the guy said, uh, well, I'm sorry, sir. I have to take him out. And he pulls him out of the car, cradles my son in his, in his arms, this little three-year-old, and he starts running to the ambulance at break speed, shouting, he's also been shot. He's been shot in the head. Well, they, they, we later found out that a bullet had gone into his head where the skull meets with the neck, causing a skull fracture and internal bleeding in the cerebellum. They quickly wrapped his head with bandages, put an oxygen mask on his face, and whisked both of us into the ambulance on stretchers, taking us to the hospital in Jerusalem. When we got to the hospital, we were sent to separate emergency rooms. And after about 20 minutes, the head surgeon comes up to me. He says, David... We're going to have to operate on both of you within the half an hour. It'll be the first of probably several operations, but there's someone here who wants to see you. So a man came up to me who I had never seen before. He says, I am the public relations director for this hospital. I just want you to know that you are the 1,000th victim of terrorism to be hospitalized in this hospital just in the past year and a half. Wow. Well, I wasn't quite sure what to do with that dubious honor. Uh, well, I could laugh about it now. I wasn't laughing then. He said, the media is masked outside this emergency room. They want to interview the 1,000th victim of terrorism and photograph you and your son. 
uh, because it's time for the evening news, and I will keep them away from you. I'll protect your privacy if you wish. Well, I thought for a split second, and I thought of all the people who we had known, all the children who we, who we had known just from our neighborhood alone, who had lost their lives, who, who, had, who had been killed by terrorists, the families broken apart, the neighbors who were driving to work wearing bulletproof vests and helmets. I said, no, you, keep, you, you have them come in. I want to speak to them. And I've been telling this story ever since. But I tell this story not because of our personal trauma, because Lord knows there are so many families that have suffered far worse. And I tell this story not because I have a political message to deliver, even though I certainly have my opinions that I'm not shy about sharing. But I tell the story because it's a story of miracles. I was shot in my left leg, even though the terrorists were shooting from the right side, which enabled me to drive my automatic car to get to that ambulance. Because we use our, auto, our right foot sure. to drive an automatic car. The bullet that went into my son's head and through his neck missed his brain stem by one millimeter. Well, these are the kinds of miracles that your average atheist will look at and try and rationalize away, and it kind of takes a spiritually trained eye to see. But then there are other miracles, which we call revealed miracles, that are like the splitting of the, of the Red Sea that just can't be denied. And on my fifth day in the hospital, I get a call from the car mechanic. He says, oh, a nice fellow by the name of Erez, he says, David, we have the, the car, we've started ordering parts, and there are 49 bullet holes in the car. It's going to be a big, a big expense to fix it. I stopped him right there. I said, Erez, I don't care about the car. The car's not important anymore. My son was in intensive care unit. He, he, he was sleeping 22 out of 24 hours of the day. He had almost total memory loss. He didn't remember his sisters. He didn't remember uh, the, his, his little friends who made pictures for him. And... Uh, I said, the car is not important. Well, Erez, the, the car mechanic, said, David, I just have to ask you a question. Then there was silence on the other end for must have been about five or ten seconds. And then I hear a faint voice that almost didn't sound like him asking, why can't we start that car? Now, I know that the car went dead when the bullets hit. I know I couldn't get it to start, but it started, and I got to that ambulance. And I've been a believer in the God of Israel for almost 30 years. But up until that point, I was skeptical about personal miracle stories. But I'm not a skeptic we'll any right longer.